linear equation. Okay? All right. So you already know this, I hope, is that if you want to perform linear regression, you want to find the slope and intercept, you should do more than two experiments. <laughs> Obviously, you could do just two experiments if you wanted to, right? Because, you know, two points to find a line. But because experiments tend to have error, it's wise to do more than one experiment, more than two. Like I would argue, if you want to find these two parameters, you should do 10 experiments or something like that, right? So that you minimize error in any particular experiment. And every, I know everyone's done this, and I'm sure your calculator does this, right? You take your data here. Here's the U. Here's the Y. You have some data points here. You want to fit a line through them. That's what we're talking about. That's a, that's a real bad job right there. Um, but you get the idea. All right. All right. So what we're going to do is form, we're going to form a set of the, uh, linear algebraic equations and then use this method of overdetermined least squares to solve it. Okay. Because you can understand each, if you have this equation right here, okay, then this regression equation, you get one equation for each experiment. Right? You get one equation y1 hat and that's u1 and y2 hat and that's u2. So you're going to get the number of equations as number of experiments. And then you have two um, unknowns. Right? So if you have 10 equations and two unknowns, that's an overdetermined problem. So that's why we're going to use the solution for overdetermined least squares to solve it. And so what I've done here is just um, written out the equations. Okay? And I'll <laughs> explain this in a, la a MATLAB context in a second. So I'm hoping everyone knows why I did this, but if you don't, I took this row times this equation and it gives me the first equation of my problem. I'm not sure I have phi again. I'm leaving that up there. What does it say when you can write arbitrarily complex equations from memory but you can't remember phi even though the class told you like five times? <laughs> It says your professor material. That's what it tells you. All right. Um, so if you take this first equation, right, you multiply the first row times the first column, you get u1, what is it, alpha 1, plus 1 times alpha 0, and that's going to be equal to y1, right? That's just the first equation, right? y1 equals alpha 1 u1 plus alpha 0, okay? So each one of these rows is just one of the equations, the result of one of the experiments. Okay, and my claim is this thing is my A matrix because I did all the experiments. I know what the U's are, right? Because I went to an experiment. I chose U because I want to see what the resulting Y was going to be. Okay, um, and I know the results of all the experiments, which is this vector over here, the Y's. Okay, so this looks like A X equal B. Okay, A is uniquely non-square, right? It's going to have two columns, which is the number of unknowns, and it's going to have n rows, how many number of experiments I did. If I was stupid, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be so harsh. If I was foolish and I only did two experiments, this would be a two by two problem. I would just invert this matrix and get the answer, right? But such a solution might be very sensitive to, to errors in the data, as we've talked about, and generally it's not, not a good idea. Okay. So what we want to do is solve this particular problem. So there's the A matrix, um, there's the unknown vector, there's the Y. We know everything but the alphas and we want to find them. Okay. So, okay. So I guess my point at this point is you know the answer. That's A, that's X, that's B. That's the answer. Right there. Right? Because we already solved this problem. It's a problem that looks like AX equal B with with more equations than unknowns. It's called an overdetermined system. We already went through the whole thing and that's the answer. So if you get a problem like this, all you have to do is substitute your A and B into this equation and get the answer. I did it there and now I shall do it here. Okay? It's because it's all set up. There's the A, there's the B. So I've already told you what the answer is. So I'm going through an example now. Okay? All right, so let's say somebody um, does the following experiment or set of experiments. So you're making a polymer. I love polymers as you've already learned. And so what you're doing is you're adjusting the amount of, so you want to make polyethylene, let's say, okay? So what you're going to do is adjust the amount of polyethylene um, and to adjust the, or see what the effect of the, the <laughs> hold on a second. 
<laughs> few hits to the skull sometime is beneficial. All right. You are going to do the following. You are going to change the monomer concentration in a series of experiments of which you perform five and you're going to measure the resulting polymer production rate and then you want to relate the two. Okay? So you perform these different experiments. All right? And you say, okay, um, that's interesting. I want to see if this can be fit, for example, by a linear model with U being the input and Y being the output. Okay, so to do this, I have to form the matrices that I talked about on the previous slide, the A and the B. So you might recall the A matrix was all the U values in one column, right? You can see those 0 through 8. And then the second column was all 1s. We need to put the 1s all there because that's what multiplies the, for each equation that multiplies the alpha 0 just by 1. Okay? And then the B vector is the results of all the experiments. That's the five experiments, the Y values put into a vector. You might remember when, we d when I taught you how to do linear regression in MATLAB, you had to do this. You, you, you remember you had to take your matrix, you had to add a column of ones onto it. It looks just like this. I don't know why MATLAB can't add a column of ones for you, but anyway, it's the same kind of idea here. So there's um, your A matrix, there's your B vector, and now you simply want to implement this solution here. You're just, you're just doing it. Okay, I'm not deriving anything new. I'm just showing you how it's used. Okay. So first thing I got to do is I've got to find A transpose times A. Okay. So again, I have five experiments, but I only have two unknowns. So this thing's going to be a two by two matrix. So there's the A transpose. <coughs> and then multiply that times A. Unless I made a mistake here, which isn't likely because I do everything in MATLAB and check my work. Um, to find the first entry, you multiply this row times that column, and apparently that's 120. And then that row times that column, 20, and so on and so forth. So there's A times A transpose. Next thing I need is, for this formula, is I need to know the inverse of that matrix. Okay? So you remember how you find the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix? You multiply these two elements together. Okay? What's that? 600. And then you subtract the two off-diagonal elements, which is 400. So that difference is 200. 1 over 200. One over the determinant of the matrix A, right? And then what you do is you swap the two diagonal elements and then you negate the two off diagonal elements to get this. This formula is in the book. I mean, and so it's in the text, in the notes. It's everywhere. There's nowhere this formula isn't, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, and then if you simply take all these, these four elements, divide it by 200, you get this thing here, okay? And now you can actually implement the formula. It says, X in this case is a vector, right? And if you go back to the formulation here, it's a vector that consists of alpha 1 and alpha, alpha 1 and alpha 0, <coughs> two-dimensional vector, so that's where I got that from. Ah, something just crazy happened, sorry. And so to find this, I'm going to compute the least square solution. So I need A transpose A inverse times A transpose times B. So there's the inverse I just computed. It's right there. That's the inverse of the A transpose A. There's the A transpose there. There's the B vector. And if you compute all this, you'll find the slope equals 28, the intercept equals minus 17. Okay. And even though I'm not going to show you this, if you used the statistical method we used before, you'd find the same answer. Okay. All right. So, looks good. Not, not too hard to do. The nice thing about this is as long as, as long as you only have two unknowns, you can have as many experiments as you want, right? Because no matter how many experiments you have, when you multiply A transpose times A, it's always a two by two. As long as you have two unknowns. In other words, as long as it's a linear equation. All right. So, it looks like I got, I got wild here. I'm <laughs> Sometimes I even befuddle myself with my bizarre behavior. But in any case, what I'm doing here is I'm computing the residual. Okay? So you understand this, this epsilon thing here, which for the first time it is called the residual. Why? Because it's the difference between the left-hand side of the equations and the right-hand side of the equations. If that is a zero vector, you've satisfied the equations exactly. Okay? But you're not liable to satisfy five equations exactly with two unknowns. So this... this I, it's very common that one computes this quantity, or actually MATLAB will compute it for you when you do this. Because how big is it is a measure of how well you're doing. If that's a big number, your fit is not good. Okay? 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to compute this quantity, right? This was, uh, remember, this is what I was trying to make small way back in the day, about 40 minutes ago or whatever. Right, when I first posed this problem, I said, let's make this quantity small, okay? So now I'm just seeing how small was I able to actually make it with a linear model. And that's this here, okay? So I'm computing the epsilon vector, so to do that, I need to take, um, let's find ax minus b, so it's a five-dimensional vector. And so, um, basically, what I've written here is that it's the difference between what I think the outcome of the experiment is and what is the outcome of the experiment, okay? So y1 hat is what I think the result of the first experiment was based on my model that I now have, because I have the alpha 1 and alpha 0, and y1 was the actual value, okay? So what I, all I'm doing is computing the difference from my model, what I think Y1 is, and what the actual data point was, and then finding that for each experiment. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, okay? And then to compute the residual, or this objective, the sum of squared errors, whatever you want to call it, you find the error for each experiment, then you form this epsilon transpose epsilon. That just consists of squaring all these things and adding them together. You find it's that number there. Is that number big? looks big. <laughs> it looks pretty big. Um, you can't really judge it until I show you a different model that has a bigger or smaller number, which I'm about to show you. And of course, if you're a real engineer, you'll do this, right? You'll plot the data and you'll look at it and you'll say, does that data look like it's linear? Um, you could always calculate a correlation coefficient. But actually, if you look at this data, you're beginning to think it's not all, it's not entirely linear, right? If I looked at those data points, right? The blue is the model, which I just plotted in MATLAB. And the data points are the red circles. If you look at that, you might conclude there seems to be some curvature to this data. At least I see a curvature, right? I see something that actually, there, it has, it's not a straight line, but it actually curves upward like that. So I might conclude a linear model maybe isn't really capturing the behavior all that well. And so I might want to try to do something else. And the, what I might want to try to do else is get a higher order polynomial, right? So linear, linear regression is just uh, one example of using a polynomial to fit the data, right? My guess is you guys maybe have never done anything but linear regression, but you can use a quadratic or a, or a, a cubic or whatever polynomial you want, okay? So what I'm going to do is show you how to do this with any order polynomial you want, and then I'll do the redo the example with a cubic, sorry, a quadratic, and show you that's, that ends up being a much better fit. I actually made up the data. I made the data to be quadratic, <laughs> okay? So I cheated, but that doesn't make me a bad person, okay? It makes me questionable ethically, but whatever. <laughs> All right, so here is a polynomial equation right here. Okay, so normally what we do is we stop at these two terms, that makes it linear, right? But if we add a term involving u squared, it becomes quadratic. If we add u cubed, it's, it's cubic, and so on and so forth. So what I'm doing is the derivation for any order polynomial you want. Okay, so it's going to be an nth order polynomial, where n can be whatever order you would like. Okay, as usual, I need some data, because what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to do a set of experiments where I find out all these alpha values. And to do that, I need data. And so I'm going to do a series of experiments, right? I'm going to change u, I'm going to collect y, and I'm going to do this n times for different values of u to get n data points. All right. And so this, in this case, <laughs> sorry. You never saw that, whatever, all right? It's not linear, but it is a regression equation, okay? So now well, all I'm doing is saying, um, this is the actual value of y, and this is going to be my predicted value of y. It's going to be the value of y I get from my regression equation, okay? Once I have my alpha values, okay? So if we look at this equation, you can see that if you have an nth order polynomial, you have n plus one unknowns, right? So in other words, if you had a linear equation, you had two unknowns. If you have a quadratic equation, you have three unknowns, so on and so forth, okay? All right. So. I wish I was smarter, <laughs> so I'm going to do this one more time. Please, please bear with me. All right. This is the, this is the um, danger of cut and paste, right? All right. 
So if I have n plus 1 unknowns for an nth order polynomial, that means I better do at least n plus 1 experiments. Actually, that was okay. Because I thought it was greater than or equal to. Never mind. All right. So if I want to find n plus 1 unknowns, I have to do at least n plus 1 experiments. It would be better to do a lot more than n plus 1. Right? So if I want to find a cubic equation or quadratic equation, I should still do 10, 15 experiments or something like this. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to formulate a matrix problem and then I'm going to use the previous solution. So I'm going to try to convince you that this is the set of linear equations one gets from this regression model. So how do I know this? Because if you take the first row and multiply it times this column, that'll be equal to y1. That's the first equation right there. Okay? And if you take I'll, don't worry about all these dots. These are just all the things I feel like not writing. But if I take the second row, multiply times the second equation, then I'll get the equation for y2. Okay? So it's just the same thing as the linear case, but instead of having, you know, 1 and u1, I have 1, u1, u1 squared, u1, so on and so forth, for whatever order of polynomial I want. Okay? So if I look at this matrix A, you can see it involves a, b a bunch of constants here, which is fine, and involves the values of u and powers of u. So this is, so to, to know this row, all I have to know is what u1 I use for the first experiment. To do this, to, to calculate the second row, I just need to know what u2 was for the second experiment, so on and so forth. So you can form, the point is this whole matrix A is known and you, you can easily calculate it. And again, this vector over here is the same as it was before. This is the result of all the experiments which I know. So this looks like A x equal B. Okay. Where A is known, B is known, I'm trying to calculate the X. And the X is the coefficients of these polynomials here. Okay? The highest order down to the lowest order. So we just did the case before where it was alpha 1 and alpha 0. Now it's higher order polynomial, anything you want. Okay? So, let's say that you wanted to do the same thing you did before. So you have the same data set. You fit the linear model and you decide, oh boy, it didn't actually look as linear as I hoped. It looked like it had some curvature, so let me try a quadratic model. So that's just the data repeated. And now you have to form the A matrix and the B vector in order to implement the least square solution. So the B vector is nothing different than it was before. It's just all the values of Y for the five experiments stacked on top of each other. And if you go back on the previous page, which I won't do to you, but if you did, you would see that the A vector, uh, the A matrix, the this column here, the last column is just all ones. The second column is all the values of u, and the first column is all the values of u squared. Okay. So like th for this experiment here, you have a one there, that's u, that's u squared. Same thing for this one, right? For the third one. 1, that's the value of u3, that's the value of u3 squared, and so on. So there's the A matrix, there's the B vector. So at this point, I'm trying to satisfy five equations with three unknowns. Obviously, I can't do it, generally speaking. So I'm going to implement the least square solution, and that's what I do on this page. I bit did a bit of a shortcut here, because I didn't feel like calculating at all. But so I'm just implementing the least square solution. That's going to calculate the x vector. And for this problem, that's alpha 2, alpha 1, and alpha 2. That's what multiplies u squared. That multiplies u. That multiplies u to the 0. So to do this, I have to form um, this matrix A transpose times A and then take the inverse of that. I did, I did this in MATLAB, I'm not going to lie. Because I didn't want to take a three. This, because you have three parameters, you're going to end up getting a three by three matrix, and that's hard to take the inverse of. We haven't really, I didn't want to do Gauss um, uh, Jordan elimination, so I just did MATLAB. And that ends up being A transpose times A um, inverse. So again, sorry, there's the A matrix. So I just formulated A transpose times A, took the inverse in MATLAB, and got that. Here's A transpose. Just took that matrix and transposed it, and there is um, the B vector. Okay? And then if you proceed to do the multiplication of that times that times that, you'll get this. So that's the coefficient multiplying u squared, that's the coefficient multiplying u, and that's the, that's the intercept, the, the alpha zero. Okay? All right. So I went through this whole thing again of calculating the residual or the sum of squared errors for this particular case. Right, just to go back here, 
briefly. I did the same kind of thing. I calculated the difference for each experiment between what my model predicted and what I actually got from the experiment. The difference here being is now this, what I predict is a cubic, is a quadratic instead of a linear equation, right? So I plugged in my model I just got. I calculated all the residuals there, the epsilon. And if you do that, you get values that look a lot smaller, right? And then if you take that epsilon and cal calculate the, you know, the norm essentially of that, epsilon transpose times epsilon, you get that number. So when someone says, is, is that number big? You're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, because this solution is like 10,000 times less air, if you will. And so if you look at the equation, I mean, if you look at the plot, you can see that I've pulled a fast one on you because <laughs> this is, yeah. It's funny, right? When you plot the data in a, with a line, it looks not bad, actually, right? Like if you, if you looked at the line I gave you, it didn't look like it, it was like terribly not, not linear, right? You go back to it, you'd say, well, you know, it's not perfect, but you know, it goes through all the data points and I don't see data points a long ways away from the line. So it seems, you know, maybe there's a little bit of error in the experiment or something. But if you, if you look at what kind of fit you can get from a quadratic, obviously it's, it's much, much better. Okay. All right. So we've, we've pulled it off again. I don't know how I do it. Um, so you're free to go. Um, and so, I, like I said, I'll try to have the homework assignment up there in early next week if you want to start looking at it. I mean, the project, project thing. Are you cheering because of the material?